On August 29, 1863, a Confederate submarine sank, taking five crew members with it. It was raised and refitted, and again in October of 1863, eight more men, including Horace Hunley, the man who created it, would climb down into the submarine, take it out into open water, and again it would sink, killing all eight men aboard. It was again raised and refitted, this time with a new name, the CSS Hunley, in honor of the man who devised it. And eight more men, all volunteers, would climb down and sit in the seats where 13 men had previously died. In total darkness, they would crank the propeller by hand in a space smaller than four feet by four feet. They would do this until the spar torpedo at the front made contact with the USS Housatonic, a Union blockade ship blockading Charleston Harbor. That torpedo would blow off the stern of the Housatonic, and the whole ship would sink within five minutes, taking five Union sailors on board down with it. But at the same time, the CSS Hunley would also disappear. At the outbreak of the Civil War, the North had 42 warships and were contracting to build 200 more. Their plan was to blockade the entirety of the South, both in land and on water, using what was known as the Anaconda Plan, to cut off all means of logistics to the Confederacy. They would do this by destroying rail lines, shipping lanes, and blockading the major ports, like here at Charleston, South Carolina. The South, on the other hand, had no Navy, so they contracted privateers, which were civilian merchants and vessel owners who could essentially be utilized as pirates capable of boarding and taking over Union ships, with the knowledge that they would be able to keep whatever they found in order to help disrupt the northern supply chain. Charleston was besieged by this anaconda plan, blockaded for several years without any significant advancement in breaking through. The city was getting desperate, and the man in charge, General Beauregard, the first general of the Confederate Army, was getting desperate. Horace Hunley, a rich planter, had been financing and working with engineers in New Orleans in order to create a submersible with a torpedo ram that could potentially help break through Union blockades. His first two iterations were both destroyed, the first scuttled during the Union advancement on New Orleans, Hunley relocated to Mobile, Alabama, and the second iteration sank off the coast of Mobile while being towed across the bay in preparation for an attack on the blockade there, being consumed by the choppy waters. His third, though, was built in July of 1863, and it was the largest he had made so far, at over 40 feet long and 4 feet wide. Shaped like a cigar, it would carry a nine-man crew, and with General Beauregard becoming increasingly desperate, he sent for Horace Hunley and his contraption, and in August of 1863, it arrived here in Charleston by rail. Horace Hunley and his crew began practicing in the rivers outside of Charleston for an attack on the Union blockade. Inside, the eight men cranked a hand-powered propeller by a single candle's light, while the commander utilized a hand pump to flood and empty ballast boxes to make it go to the surface or submerge as necessary. It also had a rudder and fins to direct it and steer it as required. Only a basic compass was used to navigate, or the commander could look through one of the two conning towers in order to navigate when on the surface. Hunley and his crew practiced for several weeks, but General Beauregard was losing his patience and ended up firing Hunley and his crew and replacing it with soldiers that he knew he could rely on and do what he wanted. On the night Beauregard directed them to make the attack, during the onload process, the submarine began to sink, and the hatch slammed down on the leg of the sixth man that was climbing in. He managed to free himself, but the five men who were already on board were trapped inside and drowned within several minutes. Beauregard sent a team of divers who had to dismember the bodies in order to get them out and raise the sub. Despite this, Hunley asked to take over again using his original crew, and Beauregard agreed, so long as Army Lieutenant George Dixon commanded the vessel. During their continued testing, though, they found multiple problems that could interfere with the mission. The first was that without a working snorkel, they became low on oxygen rather quickly, and during one test, the crew submerged to see how long they could last without having the surface for air. A group of individuals watched from the dock, and the submarine submerged for two hours before being called back up by Hunley. The candle itself had gone out within 30 minutes, and the crew sat for an hour and a half before determining that they needed air. By then, everyone on the dock had left, assuming that the sub had again sank, 
taking everyone on board with it. Yet they surfaced unharmed and with the knowledge that two hours was about the max before carbon dioxide poisoning would compromise the crew. Trial runs continued, but Lieutenant Dixon was called away on a separate mission for a short period of time, during which Hunley took the submarine and the crew out for another trial run. This would be the second time that the submarine would sink, and with it, its financier and main proponent, Horace Hunley, would go with it. All members of that crew would drown, and the submarine would be retrieved once again and rechristened the CSS Hunley. With the bodies buried, General Beauregard had pretty much given up on the idea of the submarine being feasible as a weapon of war, it having killed more members of the Confederacy than the Union, and he scrapped the plans. But Lieutenant Dixon, back from his mission, convinced General Beauregard to give it one more shot. The general agreed to this on the principle that the submarine would not submerge and that it would be manned only by volunteers. Dixon agreed to this, gathered up a group of men, turned his back on them, and then asked that anyone who would want to volunteer step forward. And to his surprise, several dozen men stepped forward and volunteered for the third mission. He chose the best of them and set out to train them in the submarine's operation. Now, most people would ask themselves at this point, why would someone volunteer for that, knowing already that the submarine had killed 13 other sailors by sinking, drowning them, a fate that really no one would want? For all intents and purposes, it was a literal death trap. And it's because the blockade, the Anaconda Plan, had done exactly what it was supposed to, which is completely separate Charleston and essentially starve them. The city, the soldiers, and the citizens were literally desperate. The blockade had to be opened up, and these men knew that there were very few options on how to achieve that. With his new crew, Lieutenant Dixon now had to wait for an opportunity with which to make the attack. On February 17, 1864, that became real, when with the calm sea state, the attack could successfully be made. The target was the USS Housatonic, a 1,250-ton warship new to the Union Navy. At dusk, at a small breach inlet, the crew climbed aboard in order to disembark and head in the direction of the Housatonic. They sat down in seats where two or three men had died previously and prepared themselves. At 7 p.m. they launched. Four miles of open water lay ahead of them and after 25 minutes, the candle would have gone out, leaving them in complete darkness. After about two hours, they began approaching the USS Housatonic. At this point, low on oxygen, and potentially suffering from carbon dioxide poisoning. Lieutenant Dixon would have guided the craft and lined it up directly with the stern of the Housatonic. Sailors aboard the Housatonic reported that they thought a large porpoise, or potentially a log, was approaching them, and then realized that it was charging, and though unable to open fire with its cannons, the sailors used muskets in an attempt to shoot and stop it. The 135-pound copper cylinder used as the spar torpedo, attached to a 22-foot-long wooden pole, made contact with the stern of the Housatonic and exploded. Five sailors were killed on board, while the Housatonic sank within minutes. It is at this point that multiple descriptions of what happened would emerge. After the explosion, soldiers on watch back on shore noted that a blue light appeared approximately 45 minutes after the sinking of the ship. And this was the signal that was supposed to be given by the Hunley crew after they had completed their mission and were returning. But the crew never returned. Hours went by and the submarine never returned to where it departed on Sullivan Island. The sinking of the Housatonic was a considerable achievement for the small submarine and certainly put some fear in the minds of the sailors that were conducting the Union blockade. But at this point in the war, the South was on its last legs, and the blockade continued without much more interference. Eventually, the following year, the war would end with the surrender of the Confederacy, and the mystery of what happened to the Hunley would become legend. Shortly after the war, in 1870, the famous P.T. Barnum offered $100,000 for anyone who could find it, which would be the equivalent of $2.2 million today. But with 100 square miles of potential search area and 1870s technology, this would be borderline impossible. Additionally, hundreds of ships sank in Charleston Harbor, and that's just during the time of the Civil War. As decades went on and as technology became more advanced, various groups and individuals would go out and search for the Hunley. 
In the 1990s, the searches would increase as wealthy financiers sought to be the first to find it at the bottom of the bay. And in 1995, 130 years after its sinking, the Hunley would be found under three feet of sill, approximately a thousand feet further out to sea from where the Housatonic sank. This just added to the mystery of what happened that night, as previous searches had all been done between where the Housatonic sank and the shoreline, as it was assumed that the Hunley was at least on its way back to Sullivan's Island at the time of its sinking. It wouldn't be until about five years later, on August 8th, 2000, that the Hunley would be raised out of the water for the first time in 131 years, and then brought to a special tank where it would sit for seven years in order to ensure preservation and stop or reverse any corrosion. It would then be brought to its current location in the museum after archaeologists were able to go into the wreckage and pull out any artifacts that they might find. This process would induce even more mystery to what happened. Up until this time, theories for the sinking of the Hunley included the potential that they took on water in some way, whether that was because they took damage from a musket or cannon from the Housatonic, or potentially surface and open their conning towers, which in some way let water in and thus sank the submarine. This would coincide with the assumption that just after blowing up the Housatonic, the Hunley used the blue light to signal the alert soldiers on shore that they were returning. But with the raising of the submarine and with the archaeologists uncovering artifacts within it, they found that all members of the crew were sitting at their position, either in the commander seat, as Lieutenant Dixon was found, or at their seat at the crank of the propeller. Lieutenant Dixon's presence in particular was confirmed with a very unique $20 coin that he kept on him at all times as a lucky talisman. This gold coin had saved his life in the Battle of Shiloh. While sitting in his pocket, it took a 50 caliber bullet directly, preventing the round from entering into his thigh and potentially destroying his femur and causing extreme blood loss and most likely his death. This bent coin was found underneath his bones at his commander's position in the submarine once the silt had been removed. This would effectively say that the members of the crew died in their seats because if they began to take on water, one would assume that they would attempt to get out of the conning towers and would either pile up underneath them or potentially make it out and drown somewhere else. But the remains of all eight members of the crew were found exactly where they would have been at the moment of the attack. It's at this point that theories around how they died morphed into several possibilities. The first is that the crew survived the blast and, though exhausted, were unable to fight the tide which was at the time going out. They would have drifted further out to sea, and if they were unable to surface, the possibility that they all died from carbon dioxide poisoning while submerged, sitting in their position, is a real possibility. There's also a chance that they rested the sub at the bottom of the ocean, waiting for a better time to return, but were unable to lift off and climb back to the surface. Another theory is that there was potentially an instantaneous concussion, or even death, from the blast of the spar torpedo. This theory has been tested by Duke University as well as the United States Navy, and they have come to several different conclusions due to variations in what they were testing. Our understanding now of how underwater explosions work would lead one to believe that being 20 feet away from a 130 pound explosive, essentially a modern day depth charge, could potentially kill anyone nearby. The blast waves are unable to penetrate through the metal, but when they strike organic tissue, like a human, they could cause severe damage internally, specifically to the brain structure. And their location in their seats would lead some to believe that they either died instantaneously or very slowly. This theory counteracts the possibility of the blue light signal being given and observed by both those people on shore, as well as members of the USS Housatonic, who also claimed to have seen a blue light after the explosion although their versions of the incident all greatly varied, especially about where the submarine approached the ship from during its attack, as well as what happened afterwards. So those versions of the events may not be perfectly accurate. There's a good chance that we will never truly know what killed the third crew of the Hunley, and further submarine attacks were either unsuccessful or not conducted. It would be 50 years before another submarine made a successful kill, and it was during World War I when a German U-boat sank a British ship. And the CSS Hunley was on its own as the only attack submarine for over 50 years.
Thanks for watching. Thanks to my Patreon subscribers for helping me get here. And as always, until next time, get lost.